I think a lot of times if people people aren't exposed to it or don't understand like a lot you know I've gotten messages where they're like I don't understand you went on The Bachelor twice to potentially get engaged to a man how do you all of a sudden just start dating a woman and I'm like I don't think you can really explain falling in love with someone like I don't think you can explain in like a paragraph through Instagram why that happened or how that happened I think it's just I think we try to put sometimes I think people try to put love and emotions and feelings into a box and it's not something that should be boxed up <laughs> chad i noticed uh you're wearing a sweatshirt today and it, it makes me want to bring up your other podcast it's called direct deposit about what happens when black people get money that's basically what it's about thank you i appreciate that shamelessly i will plug that if you want some merch from that show. You can find it on my Instagram at Chad Sand by clicking the link tree. And I should furthermore say that like, we get to do this because this is ours. Like when yes. we want to sell stuff on this show, we get to do it because it's ours. Yeah. And that's why it's important to have ownership. Yeah, that's right. That's nobody, it. nobody else owns this show. So um, I will hopefully uh, be getting one of those free in the mail. So thanks. You will get one for free. And you can listen to Direct Deposit on... On Audible for free. For free. If you like Chad here, you'll love him there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you don't like me here, you really won't like me there. Yeah, probably not. But that's okay. I love you. <laughs> love you. <laughs> All right. This week on Quitters, we are interviewing Becca Tilly. Uh, right. Wow. We are both really surprised, right? Yes. Very charmed. Very surprised. <laughs> very charmed. Uh, yeah, she was a contestant on The Bachelor, and it turns out both Chad and I know nothing about reality television. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, we got a we got an earful, but um, a charming and delightful earful, and uh, found out a lot about her quits along the way um, to the love of her life and her, her current happiness. Yeah, she was just human. Really, and like she was uh, very Southern, which I appreciated about her and very like openly Southern, which I appreciated about her. She did give us a little bit of a window into the workings of The Bachelor. Neither one mm -hmm. of us had seen The Bachelor. That was a real eye opener. So I don't I don't know like, if I need to know that. Yeah, this is like The Bachelor for dummies. So yeah, that's what we so, did here. Stay tuned. This is Becca Tilly. No, I'm telling you, the quality on this, my engineer for my podcast was like, let me just see what the quality is. And he was like, it sounds so good. So now it's it's a thing, but everyone's like, that can't be real, but it's real. It looks like something that you wear around, like on a chain around your neck to like, <laughs> yeah. because you're like, I'm, I'm a singer and this is a little, <laughs> like my mom gave me this, it's super on the nose. Like, yeah. <laughs> I know, it's it's amazing, but I can't believe it, it, it creates <laughs> It creates what I need it to create, you know? <laughs> uh, well, welcome. And thank you for, for joining us. I was telling Chad that I had met you and Haley in line at... In uh in line to get our uh to get into the Harry Styles concert with producer Rachel. She took me for my Christmas present. And I just was like, <laughs> Rachel was freaking out because she is fully part of Bachelor Nation. <laughs> I am 478 years old and was like, is Bachelor Nation like a place? She's like, okay. She broke it all down for me and um, explained how exciting this was. And I'm now done a deep dive and I feel like I'm a little bit more up to speed. But if Chad and I ask you some rudimentary questions, please bear with us. You're totally, you know, Bachelor Nation is not a place. It's a lifestyle, really. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a state of mind. It's a state of mind. It's a place that you go to. Well, it was a long time ago when I was on it. So it's totally valid. Even if you were a part, if you were like, I don't remember her because it's been a long time. <laughs> well, you were on it twice. I sure but you did your research. I was on it twice. Okay, I'm going to share about my sweet fake daughter, Sarah Hyland, who um, <laughs> Chad has met. And... um and explain that she's she's marrying Wells Adams. It's not a surprise. Like, that's out in the public. <laughs> and he was on The Bachelorette. And yeah. I knew nothing about The Bachelorette Nation or anything else. And so when I first met him, I was sort of harumphed, like, old lady style, hands across chest, and said, you need, you need, you need to explain 
why you did that. <laughs> and he, I love Wells. I just, yeah, I love best. him. I just love that man. And he broke it down for me and why he went on in such a simple, straightforward, honest way. And I was wondering if you could sort of do the same thing. I went on, my best friend nominated me for the show. So I didn't, I didn't watch the show before I was on it. Like, of course I knew about The Bachelor. I knew the concept. I had a lot of friends that watch it. I would sometimes catch like a finale episode or like the, the night one episode. Um, but my friend submitted a photo and like a paragraph about me and then they called me and I, I was raised like super traditional conservative. So the thought of me going on and like competing against other girls was like, okay, this doesn't feel like something I would ever do. But all my friends, they were like, you have, out of all the people who apply or audition or whatever, they called you. Like, you just have to see what happened. So I met with the casting department and, you know, of course you go up for something like that. And they're like, you're amazing. We think you'll go so far. And you're like gassed up. You're like, you know what? Maybe I will do this. This was kind of when Tinder was getting popular. So I'd been on like four unfortunate Tinder dates. And I was like, why not? Maybe, maybe I'll like the guy. Maybe I'll travel the world. And the whole like the ironic part is that he was a farmer in Iowa and or he is a farmer in Iowa. So majority of the season, they kept us in the Midwest because they wanted to see like how we would do in like everyday life with him. So we didn't, I didn't do much traveling of the world. My so you weren't season. like on fantasy jets and like um, hot tubs in Greece. You were like on a, on a farm in Iowa. We went to New Mexico. We went to Deadwood, South Dakota. <laughs> we went to ah. Des, Moines, Des Moines, Iowa. And yeah, no one's flying. The Only the bachelor and bachelorette fly first class. So it's kind of awkward if we're on the same flight because it's like all his little girls that he's dating passing him going no. to our economy. <laughs> Oh, that's weird. It's so classic. Hi, Becca. I'm sorry. I'm going to introduce myself because yeah, uh, Julie didn't do it. I Bye. didn't do so, it. Yep, she didn't do it. It's fine. Um, my connection to The Bachelor is that when I was 19, I interned at the NBA with uh, Rachel Lindsay, who... Oh, my God. Who, now you're going to have to help me. Who was The Bachelorette, right? Well, she, well, she first went on The Bachelor, and then she was The Bachelorette. Got you. The okay. Next season. And yeah. I hadn't, and I haven't seen uh, Rachel Lindsay since I was nineteen, except for on the bus, right? <laughs> but Chad, when you so did you know her before she was did that or after Rachel before the Bachelorette? Yeah, or after I the knew her when she was a uh, twenty two year old senior at UT. That's so she when had we not were done interning it yet. together. No, she did it like ten years later, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always thought of that show and of these shows as like a way for someone who wants to have like a public facing career to like jumpstart that thing. And it seems like it works. Like Rachel has like a huge career now as a personality and a podcaster and a host and all these mm -hmm. things. Did you see it that way, Becca, or were you just like I'm jumping into the unknown here? No, I was fully jumping into the unknown. And to be honest, like the influencer social media space wasn't a thing mm. until after the second season I did really. So that was, there was no motivation as far as like being an influencer and having, doing what I do now, because I didn't even know that that was a possibility. But I mean, I genuinely was kind of like, why not? My my boss was like, at the time I worked for a chiropractor and he was like, <laughs> whether you go home week one, week or you're there the whole time, like you'll have a job when you get back. There was no reason, like the people that I rented from were like, don't worry about paying rent. We got you. Like, so everything just lined up for oh, it wow. to be like an experience and kind of like, let's see if maybe, I mean, genuinely wanting to travel. That was like my goal. And that's to, why it was so ironic to, that I was in so Deadwood. You like <laughs> wanted to see the world. This was like, this was well, just a big I, adventure for you. Well, when I saw The Bachelor, like when I thought about The Bachelor, it was like people in helicopters like over the Caribbean. That's how like in my head, that's how I saw myself being on The Bachelor. And um, it wasn't like that. But I think in general, if I were to encompass it, it would be like, let's go on an adventure. Why not? Like, what's the worst that can happen? And I'm kind of a little more of like a private person. So wanting to be in front of a camera or be like you know, have a lot of attention on me wasn't really anything that I 
really ever strive for has led to so many opportunities for so many people who wanted to do something in their career. And Rachel was or is a an attorney. And yeah. so she just happens to be really <laughs> talented and smart in everything she does to where she just shifted to host and has been doing all this stuff since then. So I think it just kind of varies. I think it would be really hard to go on now seeing what can come of it and not have that intention in the back of your mind or the front of your mind, honestly. I have always thought it would be cool if somebody did uh, like a horror movie based on a reality show set. So Ooh. we could like really learn what the dynamics are between the participants and the producers and the crew and and all that. So like, could you take us there a little bit? Like, I just like real. I'm sure people ask these questions, but we are not really in the world to to know yeah. the answers to these. Like, are people like, what are the relationships between the participants and like the producers and the crew and all that stuff? Like, like are the cameramen like hooking up with the people who are in the show? Like, is there is there that kind of stuff happening? So before I tell my version, there is a Lifetime show that was amazing called Unreal. Yes. And they did I like, it. and it was Constance actually Zimmer. a producer. Constance Zimmer was the lead Played in the it. Producer. And then the producer or the writer of the show we used to be a producer on The Bachelor. So it's all like inspired by okay. and obviously dramatized for TV. Mm. But there was a lot of things like after being on the show, watching it that I was like, fascinating. <laughs> like, if that's real, that's disturbing. But um, I found my old bachelor journal going through my stuff the other day. And I was like, giggling reading it because a lot of it I'm talking about, you know, it's so weird because the producers want you to say things that you don't necessarily want to say. And yet they also feel like your friend. And that was like that main mm. trying to you it's know, manipulation. Be, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah I mean, they're just, they're really <laughs> good at what they do. And, and there's a sense of comfort you feel when they feel like you're, they're your friend. But then I was almost like so hyper aware of I'm on a TV show. I have a mic on, there's like seven cameras on me. And what am, am I saying what I want to say? Or am I feeling like pressured? You know, so yeah. there was always that back and forth that I never felt like I could fully relax and just like immerse myself. But I'm grateful for that because I think it kept me aware because you don't have a phone. You're not talking to your normal people. You're like in this bubble. You don't have and a it's phone. so easy. Oh, no, you don't. have. I So the first season I was on, I made it. I was like, there till the very end and I didn't have a phone till I got dumped and wow. then I got my phone. <laughs> what is that like so you can't what like tell people what's happening behind the scenes or be influenced? Yeah, I think it's just to keep your mind like very focused on the bachelor. The bachelor. On the bachelor. <laughs> That's um, crazy. And now a word from our sponsors. So you know what I was just doing? I was just moving my son Oliver's bed down to, um, uh, I've got a pool house that I'm turning into. I know, these are luxury problems. I'm turning into a guest house and I had to move it and then I had to move the bed again and I had to change everything because he doesn't like the mattress I got him for his room. He wants a sattva. He goes, I would like what's on your bed, mom. And wow. I was like, well, what about this thing that came squished up in a box? And he said, no, thank you. So I went down to the guest house. And you know what? Everybody's tried my sattva now, and they all want a sattva mattress. Wow. So I the know. boys are allowed to take naps on your bed and stuff? They're they allowed used in your to, room? We used to have, oh, yeah, we used to have puppy piles on Friday night. With, when they were little, we would all sleep in one bed on Friday nights. And that was when they were little. Now they are young men. But um, he came in the other day. I was quizzing him on something and he lay down on the bed. And I was I was like walking around folding things and quizzing him. And uh, he's like, Mom, this mattress is good. I like this mattress. Can I get this mattress for my room? Because I got him a bigger bed. And I was like, uh, yeah, sure. And I tried to I tried to trick him. Didn't work. Didn't work. <laughs> Just get a sattva. Just go. Well, we only have <laughs> one bed in this house and... Uh, Penny, our dog, is not allowed to get on it, but we're mm. allowed to get on it, and we love mm. it because it has a sattva mattress on it. Do you know? It, do you suspect that Penny looks at her dog bed and then looks at you and looks at the dog bed, and she's like, "Can I get a sattva?" 
<laughs> I do suspect that. Yes, I do. I love my Sattva mattress. My kids love my Sattva mattress. And the thing is, right now, you can get $200 off your purchase of $1,000 or more at sattva.com forward slash quitters. That's S-A-A-T-V-A dot com slash quitters. Let me ask yeah. you, you said you were super conservative from a super conservative background. And, yeah. and the name of our show is is Quitters. Was there anything, you didn't have to quit your job or your apartment or anything. You knew you could go back to working at the chiropractors. You knew you had a place mm-hmm. to live. Was there anything in your mentality you had to quit to go from having a very sort of conservative background to standing in front of seven cameras and like letting it fly? Is there any mentality or, or, or even gosh, relationship that you had to quit? I mean, everyone in my life was pretty supportive. So I never, you know, that was, I think it was hard for my family, to be honest, um, because I did, you know, I I went to hometown. So they were kind of exposed to being on camera and being a part of um, the season at the end. And, you know, with editing and how things ended up turning out, my family it wasn't great. I mean, it wasn't like the worst, but you know, mm-hmm. there were certain parts of it where I kind of felt guilt that I was like exposing people who didn't sign up Wait, for it. I, 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 you, I thought hometown was when you would go to his hometown. Well, so no. So the top four, the bachelor goes and meets the girl's family. And then the final two meet oh. his family. Oh. Oh. So I got to do, so your I got family, to do both. Your family was put like on <laughs> display yeah and of course like by that point I was very familiar with how the show ran having a camera having a producer interview me my family had one day where people came into their home (laughs) prepped them encouraged them to ask questions you know at the time I was a virgin on the show so that was like and I was never going to talk about that on the show because at the time I was a virgin like a on virgin, Julie. I mean, was a, no, no, no. She said, at the time I was a virgin oh, on savvy. the show. Mm. Like, so were you not a virgin in real life, but you were a virgin on the, like, <laughs> no, for the no, sake no, of cameras? That, that was my storyline because I was Wait, so you in, weren't actually a real virgin? See? No, no, I was a virgin. Oh, okay, you guys, I went on the show. With her tiny I was microphone. a virgin. It's hard to take you seriously. <laughs> I was a virgin. I was a virgin. Okay. Like, tap, tap. I was a virgin. Okay, so I went on the show. I was a virgin on the show and off the show. Okay. And and I was never going to talk about it because I didn't want it to be like a huge focus. I didn't want it to be like a big thing. And I I had known from previous seasons that when you talked about being a virgin on The Bachelor, that was like your whole oh, identity. Yeah. And I was mm. like, I don't, I don't want that to be the focus. And another girl was on the show and she was crying and she was like, I just told him I'm a virgin and I don't know what his reaction was. And without thinking, like, I have a mic on, I have like 14 cameras filming me. I go, I'm a virgin too. (laughs) And as soon as I said it, I was like, oh no. And one of the producers immediately was like, Becca, get over here. (laughs) So then I go to my hometown and they're like making my family ask about like, what you know, have you told him what her fantasy suite's going to be like? And I'm like, my family would never talk to like ask me this stuff. So, oh my Jeez. god! Wait, so your so your family found out about your virginity status while watching the show? Oh no, no, my family knew. But they're so, probably really happy. <laughs> they were well, yeah, they knew that about. I mean, you know, like they knew finding that about out me. that their daughter is like this <laughs> sweet, pure girl that talks into tiny microphones. Like Rachel, exactly. our producer says, explain what a fantasy suit is. Sweet, fan- oh, the fantasy suite. So oh. uh, the final three on the Bachelor and Bachelorette have the option to go into the fantasy suite, which is basically a glorified hotel room with rose petals and champagne and. <laughs> Um, for sex, ostensibly. For, ostensibly. So for, Presumably. Yes, definitely. That's what's assumed is going down. But it's the only time you get with the person that you are ultimately maybe going to get engaged to. It's the only time, alone time you get without cameras and a microphone. So, oh. And it so, was, so y'all are like, <laughs> y'all. It, also, I just, I really like how you talk and it makes me feel comfortable and it makes me feel like I can talk how I talk. Because um, <laughs> my family's from the South. Um, you get it. I do. What? Do you, so you all actually like, how, how does your connection and like affection and love for this 
individual, the bachelor, like how does it compare to like outside of the bachelor love? Like, is it, is it more intense? Is it less? Is it different? Is it the same? Like, because because of the isolation and the camera and the and the no phone and the oh, camera. Oh, you mean like stuff. does yeah. she? But is she really into the dude? Well, I mean, just like how? Yeah, but I, I assume they have to be to some extent into him. They have to be for for it to work. I would guess. I don't right? know. Or is it like Stockholm syndrome? Like you're you're so alone. You took your phone mm-hmm. away. You're in full hair and makeup and like heels all day long and being sort of. <laughs> fetishized right. and sexualized and so is he at a certain point you start to I don't know do you drink the Kool-Aid and you're like he, I do want that guy Chris who is the farmer it was <laughs> like I remember when we pulled up to like in the limo and yeah. he was standing outside of the mansion with his like tux on I was like oh this guy is so hot like I was immediately physically attracted but then beyond that you're constant okay Also, you're in a room with, you're living in a house with 20 other women. Mm. Everyone's freaking out over this man. So there's the ultimate, that, that, um, I guess, challenge of, is he going to focus on me? Like, am I going to be someone that he focuses on? And then there, all the producers are like, doesn't he look so handsome today? Doesn't he smell good? Like, you're just constantly. (laughs) Yeah, so you're like, he does smell good and he does look good and so like there is that natural attraction if you have that like if if you're naturally attracted to someone and you feel that beyond that it's like I remember we'd be having conversations that were just normal and like funny but the producers would be like you know can we maybe talk about what it's going to be like to meet your family you know things that we would never just naturally (laughs) shift to you know so yeah, it's like kind of a weird thing because I I think it's a both. I think you can really connect with someone, but I think you really don't know that connection until you're off the show to see like, is it is it sustainable in real life? Do are you, you Trista the... and Ryan? <laughs> yeah, are you Trista and Ryan? Seriously. <laughs> do, and do you see the guy like from that tuxedo moment? Like, do you see him change? Do you see him become a guy who the whole, like, world is pushing 30 women's, women, women's, women toward? <laughs> like, do you see him, like, I don't know. Do you see him, like, manip- like evolve within that? Like, does he get weird? I mean, it never, I mean, if anything, you start to get more comfortable. And then, you know, you, I think when you meet each other's family, that where, that's where it kind of, there was a shift for me where I was like, this feels a little more real what's happening but the whole thing for me was everyone was like becca is not into him like he (laughs) is wanting her but she is not into it but i just was not i would not say that i was in love with him because the producers were like i had never been in love before so i was like i can't rationalize telling this essentially a stranger to me at this point that i'm in love with him like i just couldn't wrap my brain around it and people are like you're on the wrong show you didn't do it you I didn't, didn't do it. Didn't... And I remember I remember literally sitting in an interview room and it was probably 2 a.m. And I was so exhausted. And this was at the end. I was so stressed and exhausted. And they were trying every, like trying to form it in any sentence to get me to say I was in love with him. And I was like, I'm just not there. Oh, I'm not there. Good for you. you. Know? And it was, I really held strong. And I, I did get some backlash because people were like, why did you go on the show? But... Well, why'd you go on the show? Like, it, because you want to see what happens, not because you've made up your mind ahead of time that you're going to pretend yeah. to be in love. That's yeah. crazy. And it's a really interesting psychological experiment. They put this guy in a tuxedo so in a mansion that does, it doesn't belong to him. He's flying first <laughs> class and you're in coach. And they set up this kind of like survival of the fittest competition to like get him. What happens then, like Chad was saying, when you leave the show, and uh, well, I guess you never but got now there. He's famous. Now but yeah, he's famous. Now he's famous. Julie, he, he, Julie, for the reminder that I never got there. You leave yeah. and you go freaking marry <laughs> Sarah Highland. That's what, what happens. What do you care? Honestly, what do you care that you do? You care that you didn't get there? You, the, you no, did I don't it, care. To me, you and Wells were the, did the perfect thing. Like you got far enough that you got enough. Um, like like Chad said, some sort of like. You could bu- jumpstart careers. You could be personalities. Got, people got to like you. But you also didn't have to live out a f- possibly 
really awkward. I mean, can you imagine after seeing somebody only in first class and in tuxedos and in their fake house and after hair, makeup and grooming, and then you find out they're like living in a studio <laughs> apartment in like, you know, downtown LA or like, and you're like, wow, judgy. No, you, I mean, it's just like, I'm just kidding, it's, I'm just kidding. it's just you super won, different. Becca, is what we're saying. You won. I think she won. You won. You did win. You, to you, me. you walked yeah. out with the most leverageable shit without yes. the biggest tax, which is being attached to someone you're not in love with. But then I went right. back on. <laughs> <laughs> well, but that, yeah, that is curious. <laughs> now that does make me curious. Did you go back on because you thought maybe you didn't nail it the first time? Not necessarily. Or did you really go back on because you were like, uh, no, I am open to love. No. So the second time I went on, and I actually wrote this in my little bachelor journal, it was the only entry I had from Ben's season. So I went back on the literally back-to-back -back season, which was Ben Higgins. And everything I knew about him, like we just aligned in a lot of ways. And I thought he was so cute. And I had watched the premiere with Caitlin, who was the bachelorette for that season. And he gets out of the limo. And I was like, who is that? And she was like, oh, it's Ben. And she goes, I, I think he's going to be the next Bachelor, but y'all would be perfect together. So I was like, I'm not even going to go there if he's going to be the Bachelor. Like, see you later right. to that idea. Like a couple weeks before they started filming, one of the producers wrote me and he was like, what are you doing this fall? And I was like, why are you asking? And he was like, you know why I'm asking. And I just said, you know, I really want to meet Ben, but I don't want it to be this like dramatic over the top entrance where I come in mid season. So if you let me start from the very beginning with everybody else and do a whole nother season and I, it's a fair chance I'm down to do it. And they were like, okay. Hmm. So I went back and even in my journal, I said, I'm so scared of how much I like Ben in such a short amount of time compared to how my feelings were for Chris on the first season. Because I had kind of diagnosed myself as being like emotionally unavailable. And that's why I didn't have this like instant connection with Chris. Right. And then with Ben, I think because my intentions of going on back on that season were different because I was like, it's specifically to meet Ben. Whereas the first time it was like, oh, maybe I'll like Chris and maybe it'll be an adventure. I think there was just a shift. But you and actually got further with Ben, no, Chris, than no, with I got, Ben. Yeah, I got further with Chris. And then Ben, it was so hard because I knew that he was forming like more, like deeper connections and liked other girls more than me. I could just feel it and see it. And it was really hard. I hated how insecure I felt because on Christmas season, I felt totally confident and secure the whole time. Well, you had nothing yeah. to lose. I was like, you didn't uh, I'm a cool a girl. Yeah. Damn it. I was like, <laughs> I'm so cool. I'm chill. I don't get jealous. And then I go on Ben season and I was like, does he like me? Oh, no. Like, yeah, it was, it, it sucked. But I'm still great friends with Ben. And, um, and I'm friends with Chris. And I I do feel like I walked out of both seasons feeling like no regret. What is there any sort of like bartering, like trading system that's happening there? But like, <laughs> are people trading like cigarettes for like, <laughs> I don't know, like, can you get stuff that you can't? Because you can't just like drive to 7-Eleven while you're there. So <laughs> Are people no. doing things to get the shit Are that they really want from the box from the to get uh, <laughs> yeah. like a, a pack of peanuts? <laughs> <laughs> you so you make a, a like they have a grocery list and then they have um like handlers and PAs that are just like running around and getting anything that we might need and then as like kind of it gets down to fewer people. There's a little more freedom. Like during hometowns, it was like, went and got my hair done, got my nails done, did things that were like normal. And then, um, but yeah, you're in a bubble and you're just kind of relying. You don't have anything. You literally don't have anything. And you're just trusting that these people are going to take care of your needs. <laughs> are you wow. somebody, are you somebody who doesn't experience, like, can you watch yourself? I hated watching okay. myself. Okay. So what was that experience like? And did you get over it or did do you still hate it? I hate it. I even if I'm sometimes my friends will be like mean and watch episodes in front of me just to like, I don't know, be like <laughs> jerks. And I am just like, I have to walk out. I'm like, I can't even look at myself and watch. I don't know. It's so bizarre. But it's also weird because you start picking apart things that 
you never noticed about yourself or like watching yourself talk, your mannerisms, you start focusing on things that were never a thing. And then obviously you have all of these eyes watching you who have an opinion about you. And I remember people being like, she got... (laughs) They were like, she got her veneers too big for her face. And I'm like, these are my teeth. (laughs) Oh, really? (laughs) Oh, Oh, well, they're perfect. That's what they were really saying. (laughs) This brings me to my favorite rant that uh, Chad has pointed out. I love to say this to anybody. Do you read the comments? Oh, man. I used to read comments. I used to actually read like Reddit threads. And I quickly was like, I will never do this again. So now, if I feel strong, if I feel... And now my life, like most of everything I get is like positive for the most part. If I get a negative one, it's like, you just got to brush it off. But during that time, I was so unfamiliar with having people not like me. Like in a way where I was like, what did I do? Why did like questioning myself and why don't they like me and trying to please every stranger. And right. if they were like, Becca was, you know, Becca's so boring. I felt like I had to be like so funny on Instagram because I needed to prove to them that I wasn't boring. You know, it was like such Ugh. a weird mental mm. thing where I felt like I was navigating criticism, negative criticism for the first time because my whole life I never was put in front of that many people to have an opinion about me. One of my favorite topics is quitting, quitting reading the comment section. I mean, Chad some, reads some. Very, I, read, I mean, very few, very, very I few. I read nothing, but but everybody's got that turning point, that quit moment where you go, I'm not doing that anymore. Do you remember mm-hmm. specifically what the moment was before you were like, what Reddit thread it was, what... Oh, stupid comment from guy who lives in his mother's basement 24 <laughs> said about your veneers or whatever that you were like you know what i i i quit reading these comments this is no, not good for my head i mean i have to i have to quit often because i'll be feeling good and yeah. and reading and i'll be like wow everyone's so nice and supportive and then i'll get a negative one and it might be on a day where i just can't brush it off you know it's a day where I'm feeling more sensitive or whatever. And I have to go, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm I'm not reading the comments. What does what good does this do for me? Like honestly, scrolling through the comments is a doom scroll. Like you're just because <laughs> what are you looking for? Like if you're post something and you're feeling really good about yourself, why do you need to see like you're basically just scrolling looking for the little bomb that's gonna like ruin it? Yeah. Uh-huh. But don't you think that's normal? Like most people have that kind of, that draw to the comment section. Well, the draw is the, oh my God, you look amazing. I'm so happy for you. You look so happy. And then you're like, I thank you. I'm glowing. And then, and it's like, I hate your face. And you're I hate like, your face. <laughs> and there you have All right, it. I'm done. I'm done. And that's the only one I focus on. I totally forgot about the nice ones after I read that one. But yeah, I mean, I think the appeal to comments is the good ones. And yet, why don't we stop after we read like 10 good ones and just leave it there? We just keep scrolling them. It's bad. And TikTok is scary. I don't even look at my, t- my TikTok comments because... Those can just get sent to anybody, you know? Like, what do you Instagram's mean? Kind of, well, like, Instagram's kind of focused on, like, who's following you sees what you post. So if okay. they're choosing to follow you, typically they're not going to be, like, hateful. Okay. Whereas TikTok, you're on the For You page, and oh. you're exposed to, like, anyone who's scrolling, really. And so if they don't know you, they're not a fan of you, they don't know anything that you do, they just see a TikTok they don't like, they're, like ready to comment. So I think you're just exposed to more on there. Um, the microphone you're holding, I just, I really enjoy it's it. Really, it's <laughs> like it's a really tiny, big. it's a tiny, if you're listening to this, uh, it looks like you're playing out the a video. joke on us the whole time. <laughs> it's like an itty bitty mushroom penis situation. <laughs> and I just don't know what to say there. That's now yeah. it's like, it's like Barbie's microphone. It looks Barbie. like a toy. Yeah. But it's Isn't working. It? When, it's when working. you so when you come back from like Bachelorland into your world again, you're coming back to where Louisiana? No, I was in San Diego at the time, and okay. then actually when I came back from Ben season, I was 
I was like sad. And so I stayed with on a friend's couch in LA mm. and we binge watched Scandal for mm. like two weeks and <laughs> ordered like Chinese food at just whenever we woke up at like noon. It was it was kind of like a really fun time and also a little bit dark when I look back on it because sure. I just remember it being like a dark room oh. and we would order food and it was so fun. And I'm, I'll, Ashley, I, I will be forever grateful because she was on Chris's season with me. But yeah, I was like kind of sad and I was like, do I want to go back to San Diego? You know, what am I doing now? So that's what I was going to ask. Was like, did, it, did a clock start in your head, like ticking, like, all right, well, I, ju- I just experienced kind of like heartbreak, right? Because you, mm-hmm. the boy that you liked, didn't like you back the same, whatever. Mm-hmm. And then you're now on the couch and now you're like, but there's a clock ticking that I have to like live. Like I have to, ha- yeah. you know, go work again and figure out like what's my life from here. So how did you do that? I I think I spent two weeks in LA and then I went back to San Diego and I was at the chiropractor's office and, you know, it was like just people coming in and wanting to talk about it. It was basically like a, the next patient would come in and it would be the same questions. It was just oh, like oh, so repetitive. I hope this podcast doesn't feel like that, does no, it? No, no, I mean, I haven't okay, done good. a in-depth Bachelor podcast in a minute, so it's kind of fun. I remember kind of... Be, I, and at the time, I was going back and forth to LA because I was getting invited to go to events and, you know, just little things here and there. And at the time, my friend had an agency and he was like, you know, if you wanted to do like work with brands and do like influencer deals, like you could totally do that full time if you, you know, wanted to commit and move up to LA. And I was so scared because I, that felt like such a, like it would be over soon. That you would be... Yeah, my my 30 seconds of fame is like over as soon as the next season starts. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm, you know... I was pretty aware of that. And then my mind, I was going back and forth so much that I was like, you know what? I'm just going to do it while it's happening. And if things all go to shit, then I'll move back and figure it out. But everything's worked out for me. So I... <laughs> you were not, I, you were so, not afraid to go on national television for two seasons in a <laughs> row and do an unscripted dating show. But moving from San Diego to LA was scary. Well, not having like any sort of um, structure structure yeah. or like um, backup. Like there was nothing to fall on to right. if the brand deals went away. Mm. Um, and so it was just kind of a scary jump. And I'm so glad I did it because I, I don't know what I would be doing if I hadn't and everything has worked out. But that's a big, that's a big quit. I'm always looking for the quits. You quit <laughs> having a backup. Yeah. You 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 quit having a safety net even if it's if it was working at the chiropractor's office which wasn't necessarily I don't were you training to be a chiropractor or anything? No. No, no, no. I right. I was it was yeah. Right. So but it was safety to you. It was a job, it was familiarity and you took the leap. You you quit that and you mm-hmm. moved to LA where you weren't sure 100% what was going to happen. What was the la- do you remember the moment when you made that choice? Was it was it a significant crystallized moment? I think I had a day where I had, I think I had, I had come off of a weekend where I was doing, I had gone to an event and then I think I was starting to get uh, brand deals Mm -hmm. and like seeing the money I could make doing brand deals and working with brands on sponsored content And I remember, I think I had a day at the office where I had just repeated myself like so many times with the same question. And I finally was like, I think I'm, I think it's time for me to move on. Like, I think I'm ready. And I loved my boss. I loved my coworker. Like I was so comfortable there, but I think you're right. I think I had to quit that mentality of like only doing what felt safe or comfortable because that's how I had lived my whole life was what feels only comfortable to me and not letting myself really feel uncomfortable. Like, what are the questions that if you heard them one more time, you were just going to explode? <laughs> well, it was all based on what episode aired that week. So, oh, okay. And oh, it was, God. you know, whatever was my, whatever significant moment or like, even if I wasn't involved, like, 
what was that like? Did that really happen? Like, did he, did that really go down that way? You know, it was just kind of, and people are so excited. I had no problem with people wanting to talk about it. It was just that, like, I think my coworker was probably like, if I have to hear this story yeah. one more time, yeah, I'm going to lose my mind. And I think I just got to that point where I was like, it's time. It's time to... I'm going to be really crass, but where in this process... So you already said she's holding a mushroom penis. You said that. So. It looks like a... Every time I look at it, it's like a little... I don't know what's happening over there. It's like tiny... It looks like a legit microphone. Up close. It just, but it's once you little. bring it back to your face, it's like a tiny little thing. Um, at what point... Yeah, uh, uh, and, and you can just say next. Did you... Um, and I don't know if you publicly discussed this. Did you quit being a virgin in this process? <laughs> Good question, like, Julie. Journalism. Great question, Julie. Well, I'm just curious because that's like, you're so open about, like, I cannot imagine dating in public. I cannot imagine yeah. discussing my sex life in any way. Lack of, well, maybe lack of, but like, it's so, I, 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 I'm I, in awe and and sort of like, how, how can I be more like a millennial who ha- doesn't have fear <laughs> and also, where's the line? Like, is that, is that like, is me saying, when did you quit being a virgin? Is that like, oh God, no, I'm not going to discuss that. Or are you like, oh yeah, I'll discuss that. No problem. I, can we, I have no idea. Before she answers, can we guess, do you think she's going to answer? I think she's not going to okay. answer. I am, I don't know. I think she might answer. I mean, she might, <laughs> she can answer it. Okay. Sorry. Well, okay. I'll tell you this. It was not in the fantasy suite on The Bachelor. Yes. Um, I'm happy to hear that. Yeah. I did have some boundaries for myself Good in that for regard. You. <laughs> um, and then I did have a public relationship after the show, uh-huh. like about a year after the show. And I actually think I've talked about this. I mean, you know, I too have never talked like, oh, or been open talking about my sex life. And that's why when I went on The Bachelor, I was never going to say anything because I right. didn't want those questions like from the producers and feeling forced to talk about it on national television. Alas, that is what happened. And I think it was important for me to say like, this was my decision and I'm very confident in it. And if this is the same decision that you make and what, whether it's for religious reasons or just to protect yourself or it's because what it's what you want to do. I wanted girls to feel confident in that. And mm-hmm. so I was like, you know what? I'm not going to let this be a negative thing. I'm going to use this in a way that's like, be make the decision that you want, whether that's saving yourself for marriage, not having sex till you're in a committed relationship and in love, or ha- if you want to go and have sex with whoever, like if you make that decision, then be confident in it. When I remember when I actually lost my virginity with... um my boyfriend, I remember thinking like, did I just disappoint so many people? Like I kind of reacted in the opposite way. I wanted to be like a role model for. I felt like, did I, did I disappoint the people who I was, who were drawn to me for that reason? And that's when I had to quit. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> worrying about pleasing everyone else and do things and like worry about myself. Like I remember thinking, why did I not think about myself first after that? You know, when I was processing. I, well, like, I was going to say, because the sex, I mean, no disrespect to your ex-boyfriend, but the sex must not have been all that tremendous. And often early sex is not that if that's what you're thinking about after you lose your virginity is like, I mean, I lost my virginity in college. I will share. Um, <laughs> it was not tremendous. It it took me a long time to figure out like how to make it about me and how to enjoy it. Yeah. And I I will say, I mean, I was with, I mean, he was amazing and I was in my late twenties at this point. So I was very like, you know, I was confident in who I was. I'm not trying to shade him. Sorry. No, 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 no shade. He's (laughs) amazing. (laughs) And my, I know my (laughs) processing came the following day where I was just Uh like thinking, you know, and kind of like going down the list of how I was feeling. And then that, that feeling of like disappointing people popped up. And I was like, why though? Like, why am I in strangers? Why am I feeling like worried that I'm disappointing strangers when it's Mm. my life and my decisions and were you thinking it in your in your head you obviously didn't go out and you weren't like hey guys hey bachelor nation so i banged it out last night (laughs) like you weren't doing that so was it just like you felt internally like i now i'm gonna either have to hide part of my truth or lie about it and both of those things feel weird to me i think there's something 
there's middle ground there because I think there's like hiding and then there's just not sharing everything, you know? So for me, I was like, until I felt comfortable where I was like, oh, you know what? This is part of life. And my experience was different because my choice of being a virgin was like out there for everyone. And then it just naturally came up, I think, in a conversation on my podcast and, you know, talking about, I think someone had emailed in about feeling shame around it. And I was like, you know, I've been there. And so I think it just naturally progressed into another conversation that maybe hopefully could help somebody because it wasn't um, like they weren't alone in that. So it was never like an intentional like PSA, I'm not a virgin anymore. <laughs> it was just like, Amber oh, alert. Like, this person is needing advice and I can offer something here. But you you seem like a processing person and there is like a gray area between uh between hiding and just not sharing. Um mm-hmm. and like we we know that I mean I think a lot of people know you're in a relationship now. As someone who speaks publicly often and who is interviewed often, who does podcasting, like, is there something, is there a part of yourself that is not out there that like you're interested in right now, that you're curious about right now, that you kind of like want to bring out a little bit that we can do now rather than talking to you (laughs) about stuff that you've talked about before? Um, I mean, I'm kind of, I've gotten to where I can share things that maybe I, because I am a processor and I'm also in therapy, I feel like I've really found a way to, I can be very selective. And my whole thing with my my current relationship with Haley was private, not secret, because I never wanted it to come across that she was a secret and that our relationship was something, because I think secrets um, equal, there's like some connection to shame. And Mm -hmm. I never wanted it to feel like I was shame, like felt shame or embarrassment over it. And so it was just like, it, we were out to everybody around us. And if, if we met you out. Yeah, we saw you in line. I, I was like, and Rachel was like, that's a big deal. They're together. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. it is. I guess I didn't, I didn't have the history of it, but yeah, I, I, so what made you decide? Cause it's fairly recent. What made you quit being pri- more private about it? Obviously you still have privacy about it, but quit like, cause you may, you've now sort of gone public with, yeah, your relationship, and I believe your first relationship with a woman. Yeah, my first relationship mm-hmm. with a woman, and she. I was actually in. So Haley is a musician, and mm-hmm. um, she's a pop artist, and she did a video. She's a big bachelor. She is with Rachel, a part of Bachelor Nation, <laughs> and um, she did a music video that was kind of based on being the Bachelorette and having you know an all queer cast, and um, we were talking about it, and she goes what if you were in the video? And I've always wanted to be in one of her videos, but I'm not an actress. So I never get, I never get the role, but I, um, we talked about it and I really wanted to play like the drunk emotional girl because I never got to be that on the actual bachelor. And, um, she was like, what if you show up at the end and just step out of the limo and it's kind of, you know, gives people, who have been speculating a little confirmation, but not saying too much. And after we decided to to do that and I filmed it, I thought, I think I'm ready to just have it out there. I mean, on our podcast, I never used pronouns and she had like a nickname. So I would reference my relationship and the nickname, but I never used pronouns, which was really challenging, but we got really good at like navigating it. And um, I just kind of felt like it's been four years and... It feels four feel, years of not using a yeah. pronoun. Four years. That's that's really intense. It's no wonder you got exhausted with it. How do you identify? Let me start with that. I so the whole com- I never even thought about like a label or right. I didn't, you know, and because I Haley and I met and we just had this instant connection. I fell in love with her so fast that mm. I never went into this like what does it mean? What is my label? How do I identify? Mm. And I just hope that like, and I think there's a lot of people being able to name it something gives them a lot of validation and comfort. And for me, it kind of made me feel 
more stressed, I Mm. think, because all of a sudden I was thinking, what is my label? And I think for me, I was more like, I'm just attracted. I'm attracted to people and I'm attracted to men. I'm attracted to women and specifically Haley, I fell in love with. I don't have like an issue with coming out. I just hope that one day people don't have to come out because it's a lot of it. It causes a lot of uh, stress and weight added and life is already really hard. Like falling in love should just be a natural and beautiful thing that people don't have to explain to anybody. Absolutely. And it's so like the idea that we lead with, you know, so how do you identify? And immediately you get into what you do in the bedroom. And it's like, (laughs) I'm straight. I've always been straight. I was in love with a woman for a while, but she did not love me back. She liked Mm -hmm. women, but she she did not like me in that way. And I was like, never, but it never really took off. So I never really had to challenge my concept of my sexuality or whatever. Uh But if, and this is like, if I started suddenly getting really into putting turtles in my ass in the bedroom, and this was my jam, that is not something that I would go out and be like, guys, I'm a turtle ass loving lady. (laughs) And that's who I am. Like it, it's as it's that ridiculous to be like, like you said, I hope people don't always have to come out, and I hope that mm-hmm. we don't have to lead with what what you do with your body is should not be the first thing that we know about people or care about. That's that's your business. Yeah, I agree. I think it's um, I think a lot of times if people people aren't exposed to it or don't understand, like a lot, you know, I've gotten messages where they're like, "I don't understand. You went on The Bachelor twice to." potentially get engaged to a man how do you all of a sudden just start dating a woman and I'm like I don't think you can really explain falling in love with someone like I don't think you can explain in like a paragraph through Instagram why that happened or how that happened I think it's just I think we try to put sometimes I think people try to put love and emotions and feelings into a box and it's not something that's should be boxed up (laughs) Coming from a a conservative Southern background, as you do, mm-hmm. like, how did you learn how to see the world uh, through your own eyes? Because it seems like you do that. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it took a long time, though. I I would say my late twenties was the first time I started even kind of thinking and seeing different perspectives than how I grew up and what I always believed and thought because that was safe. Like that was comfortable to challenge. Like even having a faith background, like my faith is so important to me, but challenging what I was taught my whole life Mm. about just different things in general. It's so, I think people think challenging faith or challenging your beliefs is like the easy way out because it's like, you're just tailoring it to what you want. But I personally find that challenging your faith and questioning things that have always been the constant in your life is one of the hardest things you can do because you're shaking up something that's been so steady your whole life, you know? Like, I never had a reason to think about it until, you know, my younger sister came out to me and that that was when I was like, okay, this was before I met Haley. And I was like, now I have to shift some things because this is someone that I would do anything for and that I adore. And how do I protect her in this world? So your world? brand of, of Christianity, your faith is is what? How would you how would you describe it? Your brand, um, damn it. Your brand. What's your brand? What, what's your, your religious brand? brand? But I don't know which, like, <laughs> because I do identify as like Baptist, Southern Baptist. Do you identify as just Christian? Do you, you know, like, how do you identify? Yeah. I identify probably, I would say Christian would be how I identify, Uh but um, I grew up, you know, I went to like a Baptist school and um, Christian school. And so it was very, it was surrounded me. And I was, I'm really grateful for my background. And I don't know that I would change anything other than giving, being given permission from, you know, teachers or whoever to, to think on my own. So were you raised with like, hellfire and damnation for no, like the not super not super intense like that but okay. i was, this is, you know way, this is not one of these hollywood shows that's shitting on religion because we have a we have sort of a therapy uh industrial complex on this show and so like <laughs> i don't want you to feel any pressure to try to sound like no. a, like some new age hollywood person oh no i'm not no i am not that at all i just am like 
I'm kind of navigating it for myself. And like, I know what I believe and who I believe in and my relationship with God, but I don't sometimes, you know, you can't take people who are bad in a certain category and associate everyone with that category. You know, like I'm pretty, like you can't be like, one person in this group did something bad, so they're all bad. However, the way I cert- sometimes see people who identify as Christians make me not want to mm-hmm. identify mm-hmm. as that. But then there's like so many wonderful Christians mm-hmm. who do it the way that I want to be. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's complicated when I talk about, you know, being a Christian because it's it's not as defined as it used to be for well, me. Well, there's so many varieties. And, and I mean, you can go to a, 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 a Presbyterian church with a gay pastor and mm-hmm. then, you know, all the way. There's 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 so many different, um, that's why I was saying brands of Christianity, but there's so many different right. st- branches is better word. But <laughs> you had an opportunity then when your sister, and if you're comfortable talking about it. So when your sister came out to you, she's, she's queer. Yes. Yes. That yeah. was that. Did that help you kind of change? Do you think that helped change the, your thinking in a way that allowed you then to fall in love with a woman? Yeah, I would say it probably did. But also, I remember thinking I had dated people, and I just remember thinking, I think it can happen with anybody. Mm-hmm. I don't want to shut. And I think I even was telling my friends this like a month before I met Haley, like, you know, they were like, would you ever date a girl? And I was like, you know, if I met someone and there was a connection there, I don't, I wouldn't shut it out or shut it off. And I mean, I literally think it was a month exactly after I met Haley. And I was actually wearing a shirt that said no time for romance when I met Haley. Which oh, is- oh, that's <laughs> do, sweet. Do, do you and Haley um, share faith? Like, do you all have the same religious beliefs? No. So she, she's um, actually born and raised in LA and she kind of grew up not really with any um, association with any religion. And so it's been interesting, like learning from each other because we see things differently and we view things differently. And she's very respectful towards my faith. And she's always said it's something, you know, that she was drawn to. She always says like, I was drawn to like your light and I, your faith and like what you believe. And I think that there's just like a really beautiful respect there. And then same with her. It's like, I get to see a different perspective of like someone who was not raised with any religious um, rules or faith background. Where do you live? You live in LA? I live in LA. Okay. <laughs> right now, and I think she lives I, in a laundry I did room. Say that. I, I can't. I'm like, I, I can't, can't even show it. you. I can't get I past organ- it. What am I seeing? I have organizers. Uh-huh. I have organizers in my house. Uh-huh. Like, we're purging my whole house for them to go through and organize everything. So I have racks and clothes surrounding me. Those are, are two pants behind you. Thank you. Are so those much. pants? Those are I really cute. Okay, I could not tell what it was. <laughs> is that something? <laughs> that, it's is a that, prison jumpsuit. It's a jumpsuit. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, yeah, they're, they're, I like a jumpsuit. Really cute pants. But when Wait, you, I, oh, yeah, sorry, go, go ahead, Chad. I just wanted to ask how much you go back, and I, I, I think we're about the same age ish. Like, I, I would never ask, but I think we're about the same. I'm I mean, I can probably Wikipedia. <laughs> yeah, I'm 34, yeah. so okay. I feel like going home is it's more complex now than it was when I was like, let's say like 25 or whatever, when I still like had the exact same values that I left home with to some Mm -hmm. extent. And I feel like that must, I'm guessing that must be amplified for you because you have like so much of your change has been public. I shouldn't say your change, but just like, yeah, your your personality is so public. Like what's it like going home for you? I have, so I have an older sister and brother-in-law and they have, I have four nephews and they live in Louisiana and then my parents and my brother in the South. So I go to the South, you know, I go every year for Christmas and try to go like summertime or stop, you know, whenever I'm, whenever I have time and I'm like, I can make this trek because, you know, it's a long, they live in Florida. So it's a long haul for me. I just have to point out um, that you call Florida the South. <laughs> And well, okay, so where, wait, wait, what? so where my family lives is on the border of Alabama. So it technically is like South. But you don't call Louisiana the South. 
Yeah, the Louisiana is the South. Okay, all right. Okay, sorry, I misunderstood. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> I think we have Louisiana is the South too. But you said I'm, you said my sister and brother in law live in, in Louisiana, Louisiana, and then my mom, and I mean my parents and my brother live in the South. Oh, did I say that? Yeah, you did say yeah, that. But... Yeah, and that's I was like, <laughs> wait, Louisiana is not the South. <laughs> I don't know what's happening you know? anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have an excuse on the top of my head, but my family's in the South collectively. Got it. Love it. Got you. Summer yeah. in Florida, summer in Louisiana. Yeah. Got and you. then Christmas, uh, we normally go to Louisiana. And um, I think, yeah, I think there's just got to be an understanding with family. And like, I would tell this to anybody of sometimes there's differences. And I think as long as there's a mutual respect. I think that's what's the most important because the ult- ultimately, I feel like we all love each other and we want to be together and hang out and spend holidays together and do all the things that we did growing up when maybe it felt a little easier. But I think that's kind of what it comes down to is more just I want to see them and I make the effort. And even if we disagree on certain things, it's, you know, as long as they respect me and we can just love each other and put that first. That's the priority for, I think, everybody. What's the Mm. definition of of respect then? Like, keep your opinions to yourself? Or is there, what does respect mean to you? I think I don't want to get into this. Oh, I like that. Ooh. Yeah. I was, uh, and you know what? Julie's on it. Julie's journalist is here today. I I respect you for saying that. She's asked two questions that didn't get answered, which is really good. (laughs) That means you're really pushing the boundaries. I love it. That's awesome. (laughs) Because it's my family. You know, it's like, I talk about myself and I I have, I can say whatever and it's Mm -hmm. my, it's my life. So I just, they, I, they already were dragged into the bachelor stuff so i just mm. they're a little more private so i don't like was, was there ever a time that you you ran into that and you went you feel that you went too far in violating your family's boundaries and like that's what we're seeing now is you <laughs> you t- t- repositioning to a better like a safer place for them i think i think that's part of like the respect thing mm-hmm. is like being like, hey, you know, this is my story. A lot of these are my stories and my experiences. And unless they were on here sharing their own right, experience, I right. don't think it's fair to like speak on their behalf. Got it. So got it. I think that's that's really it. But I I mean, I do think I think leaving and having new perspectives and different perspectives is hard even talking to people from back home. You know, that's not even my family just Sometimes the conversations are a little more uncomfortable and Mm. it is what it is. I mean, I think if you can relate, then you, you get it. Well, what do you do when you have not your family? You go back South, let's say, either Mm -hmm. Florida or Louisiana, both in the South. (laughs) I only go home to the South (laughs) to see my family. So any other uncomfortable conversations are normally done via like Instagram. (laughs) Oh, okay. So somebody who is not showing respect or not... Um, or is challenging your f- the way that you live with your faith or whatever whatever preconceived ideas they have that are upsetting them. Uh, how do you have that conversation or do you just not have that conversation? If someone messages me and it looks like it can be a productive conversation, like they're not irrationally angry or like saying things that mm-hmm. I'm like, this is not someone that I'm going to have a productive conversation with. I don't, I won't respond. But if, if they send me a message mm-hmm. and it's, you know, like, I don't really understand how do you rationalize this with your faith? I am I'm more inclined to respond. And I, you know, sometimes I'm like, it's okay not to understand someone else's decision or or maybe you can't relate. And I think in my early 20s, I was very, um, you know, I was very much believed differently, especially about same-sex relationships. I was, I was someone who was like very judgmental towards that. So I have a little more grace for Mm. people in that because I too have held those beliefs. So for me, it's more like, I don't need you to understand like, who I date or what my faith looks like, because the whole thing is that that is my relationship with Haley and also my relationship with God. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of times it's, it's really easy for people to focus on or question what other people are doing because maybe they've got something going on in their life that they don't want to deal with. So it's way easier to put focus on what someone else is doing. Cause when you're living your life and you're 
happy and doing your own thing, you're not really focused, putting too much focus on what a stranger is doing or, you know, who they're dating or whatever. And um, so I think it's just if if I can have a productive conversation and be like, we don't have to see eye to eye. Thank you for doing this in a way that was productive as opposed to being rude or cruel or saying something hurtful, then I'm totally down to have those conversations. And I don't, I am, I have gotten to a point which has taken a lot of time and work to not need people to agree with everything I do and align with everything I believe. I, it's really powerful to like hear you say these profound things and then have that really little tiny <laughs> microphone in your hand. It's amazing. <laughs> She's um, a comedy genius. She's well, a very subtle it's really, it's comedy so genius. Funny. And I'm so glad this is visual because <laughs> it's just good. Um, <laughs> who, what, who were you? What t- table did you sit at in high school? Mm, in the cafeteria? Well, my senior year, I would finish class and then I got to go I got to go off campus and like I would go get food and then sometimes I'd bring my lunch and I actually went and sat my mom was a PE teacher so I oh. went and would sit in her office and eat with her oh. so, what were you avoiding in the in the what tables did you not want to have to deal with then she just liked her mom uh, yeah I don't know I was I went to a really small school so it wasn't like a a thing where there was like that many options like I think my graduating class was like 42 or something so oh wow that's really yeah it was a really small school so I it was never like oh I'm getting you know bullied I need to go with my mom I just was kind of like I prefer to be with my mom (laughs) okay well that killed my My whole my my whole theory about you in high school wait what was your theory yeah I want to hear this I thought I thought either it was kind of lazy it was like either you were like the prom queen um super like SGA president like everybody would have voted most likely to be on the bachelor or <laughs> yeah. I thought you might have been like a little um like kind of grunge like like pink and that oh. and that eventually you had like a transformation and became um I don't I don't uh, however you would describe yourself now that is <laughs> way to back down, Sandra. Wait, that way is to back down. Gru- I'm like honored that you think that I would be cool enough to be like grunge because I actually was prom queen, but, I know. See, I knew. but I knew. please remember I graduated with like 40 people. So oh. let's not put that too. It's still you know, number one out of 40. But do you think that that so you were That's sort better of... better than you did on The Bachelor. I'm just kidding. I'm you just were, kidding. Uh, you're not I'm wrong. You're not wrong. You were like lauded then in, in high school. You were attractive and people... You were you were called out for being... Not called out in a negative way, but you were made prom queen and stuff. Did that kind of get in your mind? Because I, I used to think when I was a kid, um, when I if I'd win an award or get elected to something, I was like, I guess this is my... I guess this was sort of the way it's going to be. Like, I'm going to be forward facing like I didn't think I was going to be like a celebrity which is like a stupid word but I did start to think oh I suppose this is it's like chicken and the egg I'm not sure what came first but you start to sort of be you're elected or you're nominated or you're crowned or whatever you start to go I guess I'm this is who I am I'm the person that is in in forward facing and and I'm at the the lead of the pack not of being smartest or best but kind of being the spokesperson Did you have that experience? I think that was a hard thing for me when I went on The Bachelor because my whole life, I played sports growing up. I was really like, I was a good athlete. So on top of sports and always, I I was a really good student. So I, my whole life had been praised to a certain extent Mm -hmm. on Mm -hmm. different categories of my life. And I think when I went on The Bachelor, that was the first time where I kind of was like, there was negativity around me, you know, Mm. like there was negativity about my personality and how I looked and things that I had never had to like confront about myself. And did that, did that free you in any way? Like, I don't know. Did you realize a new part of yourself in that? Or was it just like, no, this sucks. I failed. Um, I didn't feel like I failed, but it was definitely like, this sucks. But I do think now looking back, I'm a lot more like, 
I have a thicker skin that I never had. I never had to have a thicker mm-hmm. skin. And huh. um, I feel a lot more capable of navigating negativity or criticism and also being able to recognize criticism not always as a negative thing because Mm. I think I always thought of criticism as like hate or like a troll and a lot of times criticism is just helpful something that makes me more aware of something that I'm doing and I can appreciate it a little more even though like it might initially sting I can be like that was good perspective like I'm glad they said that to me Mm. You've lived so much then of your sort of adult life kind of in in, in the public. Out you've been you've been a, a celebrity. Um you're you are a influencer. Is there do you have a drop dead for yourself as far as like do you want to disappear out of that? Do you want to always stay in it? Do you have a 10-year plan for expanding your your uh public image and your presence in the public? Or do you see a time when you go, I I quit this? I'm not like a self-described go-getter. So I'm not some like, (laughs) there are a lot of people who are like, have their hands and everything, you know, like they're creating brands. They are on TV. They have a, you know, they're doing it all. And I watch it from my couch and I'm like, that's really inspiring. Like, I'm so happy that, that they're doing that. And I... (laughs) I'm really happy doing what I'm doing right now. I think I always just, I think as long as I'm having a good time, majority of the time, like it's not always perfect. And, you know, sometimes it's frustrating and I just want to throw my phone and get like a flip phone. But um, I think as long as I'm enjoying it and also finding the balance of like, you know, being able to travel and see places and actually live life without it feeling like it needs to be documented for social media. I love doing what I do and I will do it as long as I am able to. I don't want to be someone who's like desperately trying to hold on and like slinging like flat tummy tea to like hold (laughs) on to. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? I only say that because I did it when I first started and I was just saying yes to everything because I was like, this is going to go away in two seconds. And then I realized that actually not saying yes to everything and being careful of what I'm actually saying yes to, to to promote and making sure that stuff that I like and that I would use before I sell it to someone else was a very big turning point for me because... I remember doing flat tummy tea and I got destroyed in the comments. And I was like, (gasps) okay, like this was eye opening and I'm not going to just say yes to anything ever. So it was the comments that that made you go, I'm not doing that. That was the... The comments stopped me from making so much money from tea. (laughs) (laughs) But it did set me up for a place where um, I was... You know, I I have the option to be particular what I what I, who I work with, which is really I'm really grateful for. Wait, did you walk out though? Uh, did you finish your commitment to flat tummy tea, or did you literally like walk away from that mid midway when you had too much hate coming your way? I think I I finished it. You finished it. Okay. Now I was looking now, for a quit in there. I was I was the I was, me. I was, <laughs> Quint. The me. Jen gave us several quits. I know, I know, but I can't. <laughs> this can't episode stop. is brought to you by Flat she can't Tummy quit. T. <laughs> she can't quit <laughs> fighting the quit. I can't quit yeah. fighting the quits. I just want to go, because actually quitting something, like um, Chad quit the tech world where he had like, you know, he was doing a normal like cubicle to ladder to, you know, like HR meetings and what was that thing God. yesterday we talked about? It? All all hands-on meeting? What was it called? All hands. All hands. <laughs> You've <laughs> been to an all hands, Julie, with me, actually. But I didn't see the people in an all hands. <laughs> I, know, like a, I know, I know, I like know. Like yes. a total corporate I was on world that, I, job. Yes, doing right. that thing, yep. And yep. It, all the words are foreign to me. And so to like those moments when somebody like actually goes, I quit. Like where there's a contract, there's money, there's expectation. Oh yeah. That is, I mean, I, I like just my stomach drops every time I hear a story like that. Cause it takes, it, it, it takes a lot. You have to have been pushed very far or you got to have like real balls and Chad has both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a conversation I'm hearing a lot more from um, people who, are like on TikTok and doing kind of entering this world, there's a lot more 
pushback that I never felt brave enough to have. And I actually saw a girl post that she was working with a brand and they wanted her to talk about it or post about it in a certain way and they wouldn't budge. And she finally just said, I, I, I let that go. Like I let that and brand she left deal that go. money on the table. Yeah, yeah, because you you have to kind of think like for me, I realize if people are trusting me with what I'm posting about, then I can't I can't fake it. And I'm not an actress. Empirically speaking, this is what people are saying now. Like you have the most coveted job of people who are entering adulthood now. Like you mm-hmm. are uh, what is that job? I don't. I don't want to use a word that you don't ascribe to. Like, you. I mean, I have really struggled to accept the influencer title, but it is yeah. now, like you said, what people are striving to do and become. Um, look, I have my podcast, so I also say I'm a podcaster, which yeah, helps you're break the influencer. Totally, yeah. totally. I used to be in like Ubers and the Uber driver would be like, so what do you do? And I would think, how long is this drive? Because if I say influencer, it's going to be a long conversation trying to explain what I do. So I would I would like often be like, I'm a dentist. Because like, there's no follow-up <laughs> right, question, right, you know? Right. It's just like... And your teeth are perfect. Great. So they didn't work. My veneers. Are <laughs> your, your, veneers your veneers are a little big. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I think you should work on your veneers. Otherwise, you look Jay great. But, but, but I, uh, so I bring that up just to say... Um, well, it now actually doesn't track in where we are in the conversation, but I'm going to say it anyway, <laughs> which is I think it's underrated like how much you have to invest to do your job um, because mm-hmm. we're talking about turning down money. Like we're talking about real contracts that are real dollars and cents. Mm-hmm. And I was curious from the beginning of this thing, looking at your clothing rack and your Cetaphil lotion and your baby oil or whatever else you have up there. Like what, like how, I don't know how to ask it, but How much goes into like being you all the time? Like, like I imagine glam team and managers and like crazy logistics and all this other stuff. Like how much goes into doing your job, the job that everybody wants? I think I used to be a lot more um, on it. I, I'm serious. Like, I'm not trying to be funny when I say I'm not a go-getter. Like, I'm borderline <laughs> lazy. Like, I, love I love that. I, I, I like wowed by that. And the admission, <laughs> most of all. I'm like, <gasps> you're allowed to say that? <laughs> I love it. I just, like, when I commit to working with a brand, I'm going to do my best work. But then that's like... <laughs> I'm I'm not like doing the most trying to get more, you know. Like, I'm just that's like my best, guys. So you're like uh, not a lot I goes got. into it, Chad. I'm just doing well, great. Th- no, there's actually a lot that goes. I I just had this conversation with Haley last night because I was saying how 2020 kind of changed the game of like how people want to work because people don't want to, you know, people mm. are like I don't want to go back into an office. I want to work remote. Like people are just like mm-hmm. they, all of a sudden there was this new way of life that we've never really been forced to Mm-hmm. accept or live and i was telling her how being an influencer is like what everyone's wanting to do and with tiktok people watched normal people with everyday lives like have this massive shift in their whole entire world and become millionaires overnight mm-hmm. and i was like but even that people don't realize is work yeah. like you're still working but i i think i've really been able i i got really burned out for a couple of years and i was going to anything and everything i was working with i was working so much and i was traveling but it was work trips so i would come home unpack repack and then mm. go to the next thing and i was so burnt out and i was like i just want to be at home and i think that was a shift for me where it was like I want to be able to do this and not have it run my life, you know, because Mm -hmm. even with that, when you're kind of in charge of your own, I guess, freelancer, whatever you want to call it, when you're in charge of your hours and how much you're working, you can have times where you're not turning off or saying no or shutting anything down for days because everyone's like, you're you're reachable to everybody. You know, my manager can get a hold of me at any time if they need something from me. And there's something 
really cool about that. But there's also something that's cool about having a steady nine to five job because you right. know that when that hour hits five, you are off duty and no one's expecting anything from you until 9 a.m. the next day. And I think um, I think people see this like glorified idea of what being an influencer or social media creator looks like. And it's really awesome and it's really fun. And I I think about how grateful I am for it all the time, but it's still work. And I think that just like everything in life that you're doing, there's going to be days where it's really great and there's going to be days where it sucks. And I think... Um, basically what I'm trying to say is that you're right. I think there's a lot that goes into it. And I used to have a lot more like I would get my makeup done and hair done for things. And now I'm like, I know how to do my makeup. I can do my makeup myself. I know how to do my hair and take that kind of pressure of it off and um, just kind of like be able to go and enjoy it, get what I need to get done. And then also be able to take in like I'm at this really cool event that I used to drive up to from San Diego for all the time. <laughs> And would you be, you said you're borderline lazy. And I love that because I think yeah. that you have, I, I, I don't believe that you're lazy, but compared to like people that are doing, you know, creating content 24 hours a day and like, then they're going to the Hollywood sign and covering it in bras. And you're just like, oh my God, it's yeah. so much effort. Does then your, your girlfriend is a pop star and mm -hmm. she tours. I mean, she probably mm -hmm. had COVID off. That is an yeah. enormous amount of go-getterness. Like, yeah. how does that, how, what is your intersectionality there? Like, can you guys chill together? Or are, are you just like, that's great, honey. You 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 rehearse eight <laughs> hours today and then record some stuff tonight and I'm going to make a pot pie. <laughs> well, unfortunately, I don't cook either. Um, but <laughs> I, she is a go-getter. Like, I am so inspired by her because she is, so talented in so many different areas in life and she really like puts her all into all of them somehow like I'm like what if you just focused on music and <clears throat> excuse me didn't focus on all the, all the other things and she's like it's just that like I I like having my hand in everything and I there's there's that from like a partner perspective where I'm just so proud and inspired of her and then also sometimes when I'm like I've been sitting on the couch all day by myself and I need attention on me when you're here <laughs> um so it's kind of like when we go on trips and stuff sometimes when we go on trips she's like I'm here to relax because I'm finally not working and I'm like I'm gonna get content for a reel or a TikTok <laughs> so <laughs> I'm like, will you film me? Um, so it's just finding that balance and her knowing that, you know, my job is that and me knowing that her work has always been a huge priority and something that I can be inspired from because I am not that. Do you see anything in your life? Like, obviously, you're cleaning out your house. Like, there's things that you, yeah. you're shifting, your energy shifting between A, from A to B, from um, maybe you're entering a new phase of your life. Are there any quits that you think you've got on the horizon? Mm. You can say no. You're allowed to say no. Well, I'm just trying to think because as I'm purging everything, I'm I'm like going to quit keeping so much shit in my house. What? Are you a little bit, of, are you a baby hoarder? Okay, so I'm not a hoarder. I I just get a lot, this, I'm, I'm obvious, I got like so she defensive so because defensive. Haley, I was going to be like, we might just bring it up later when you're not on and be like, she's clearly a hoarder. I mean, Haley obviously. Me, Haley always calls me a hoarder and I'm like, I am not a hoarder. Like, in fact, mm. the girl that's helping me purge today, she was, or yesterday, she was like, you're one of the, best purgers I've ever worked with. So a hoarder mentality would not be able to easily get rid right. of things. I just get so much stuff sent to me right. that I am like, it's good stuff. I don't want to just like throw it away, but it just sits in a room and right. nothing happens with it. So um, I'm not a hoarder. <laughs> I just get a lot of stuff. Uh, so what do you do with this stuff? Do you have like a system? Maybe you just start a business or a charity where you so get rid of... That's what. Free They're stuff. helping me set up a system. So I'm donating anything that like hasn't been used or isn't expired. I'm like donating everything. They have a company that comes and sorts through it. It's the company I'm working with is Life in General, and she's amazing. They're they're the I've never seen a system like this. Like 
I, Wait, what's it called? Like, life in general. Like, can I find it? Like, lifeingeneral.com. I want to. It's life in general, but the gen, general is with a J. So her oh, name's Jen. Her name's Jen. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Isn't that such a good name? Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, it's all stuff that I could do by myself. You know, it's like saying yes, no, or donate. But you, you but need someone to hold your hand sometimes. Just I crack need the whip and make be, it work. I needed to be held and whipped, and <laughs> held and whipped. <laughs> I w- and you said you were wow. not going to be personal. <laughs> that My <was> God, <laughs> unintentional, but well played by me. Thank you. Uh, is it only your like. stuff? Is it only your stuff that's getting purged, or is Haley's stuff getting yeah. purged too? Um, I have put all of Haley's stuff to the side, and she's going to have to do her due diligence and go through it when she's over here. But I, um, I'm just purging most of it's mine. Haley, we have we always stay together, but we don't live together. She has her own place, so we. She has all her, she has some stuff here, but most of her stuff is at her place. So can I tell you as a, as a divorced woman, that is the ultimate relationship. <laughs> like <laughs> to have a separate space, like people don't, people can love each other and not live together well. Mm-hmm. And people can live together well and then, and not love each other. But like yeah. the idea of being like, yeah, you can have you know, uh, you could have your own chaos space or your own anally freaky clean space or, you know, and and we can share a life, but we don't have to always share a space. And that is the ultimate privilege. I recognize. I'm like, totally. I, I keep thinking yeah. about how I said I made fun of somebody for living in a studio and Chad called me out. I'm going to live like that. It was obnoxious and I hate myself for it. <laughs> but so, but no, if, yeah, no, because no, you, the, you, the, you the irony of that thing, though, was that I lived while I was on The Bachelor, you were saying like The Bachelor lives in like a studio. I lived in a literal bedroom that was like outside of someone's house. So it was it was even smaller than a studio. I was judging because you said the studio was in downtown LA. Oh, I don't. I was just you, trying to say, like, I don't take that back. Becca, thank you so much for, we, I think we have, uh, uh, this was really fun, man. You're really likable and your she voice really is good. Is. Your teeth are perfect. And <laughs> your tiny you microphone pants, makes us laugh. Your little microphone is fantastic. <laughs> so thank you so much for coming on. I thank really so understand me. why people, uh, why you're an influencer. Because you're just very real about it. Like, you're like, I can, no, no can do on tummy tea. And I'm, I'm borderline lazy. Like, I, if I had a product I wanted you, I'd, I'd come right to you. I like it. I like it a lot. And thank you for being like, yeah. so chill okay. and uh, open with us. Yeah, thank y'all so much for having me. I honestly had a blast. And I. it's really nice to be on a podcast where the conversation flows for however long it's been. An hour and a half. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and we're going to send you a lot. I have a whole room full of stuff that I need to give away. I'm just going to send it to you right now as a thank you. Please. And you can I, purge it. I don't want I anything can. else. Do not send me <laughs> I would never. I hear you. Um, please say hi to Haley. And we, uh, we're we just really, really appreciative of you coming on. So thank you. Thanks for having me. I hope you have a great week. Thanks. Thanks. 